<laughs> Welcome to the uh, Faculty Forum Online, a program of the MIT Alumni Association, sponsored in part by MIT Professional Education. I'm Judy Cole, Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I will serve as the moderator today. We are taking your questions for our guest today, so please use the box below the live stream to enter them, and we will get to as many as possible. Our guest today is Bill Aulette. I was told not to call him William because that means he's in trouble. <laughs> SM94, Senior Lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, who will talk with us about the growth and future of entrepreneurship at MIT. If you read Professor Ed Roberts' 2014 report on MIT and the innovation economy, if you read, excuse me, uh, then you know that MIT alumni have launched 30,200 active companies employing roughly 4.6 million people and generating roughly one trillion in annual revenues. Bill is the managing director of the Martin Trust Center for Entrepreneurship at MIT, which Roberts founded in 1990. In his three years at the helm of the Trust Center, Bill has conceived, designed, and overseen the implementation of many new innovative programs, including the MIT Clean Energy Prize, the Global Founders Skills Accelerator. In a quarter, in, in a quarter century of entrepreneurship himself, Bill directly raised more than $100 million in funding for his companies, investments that have grown to hundreds of millions of dollars in market value. Bill, thank you for joining us today. Can you start by giving us an overview of some of your current research interests and projects underway at the Trust Center? Yes, well thank you Judy very much. It's a pleasure to be here and hello to all the alumni out there. I'm amazed at how old I look there on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> but I am old. So, you know, with regard to what we're, what, what we're looking at right now, um, for our first and foremost focus is educational. Um, and so we provide an education for the students and that's very, very important to us. Um, but as we look at it otherwise, we want to make entrepreneurship a serious profession, a respected profession. And to do that, there needs to be a body of knowledge that people are in a common language. And um, people have to agree that entrepreneurship is a, um, is a skill set. It's a, it's, it's a teachable skill. And one of the things that we just work this weekend is working on and we're talking about a lot is entrepreneurship is a craft. And, and that might sound trivial, but it's not trivial at all because it's not a science. I know at MIT we like deterministic things where X, if, if X and Y happen, then Z will happen, you know. Um, and that's, we know that to be true. Um, that doesn't work in entrepreneurship. If you do X and Y, you don't know whether Z will happen. Your odds may increase, so it might be a bit like, you know, um, Einstein, you know, the theory of, uh, theories of uh, relativity or I should say, the quantum mechanics, I should say. And, um, but it's not an art either. An art is something that's for a few people and it's really hard to teach and you can't teach it at scale. Craft, on the other hand, is between these two and it's something that we can teach people. It's building something, there's apprenticeship involved, but at the end of the day, it's teachable and they're first principles. And when you get these first principles, you have a much higher odds of producing something that's unique and valuable and new. And that's what we're looking at right now. How do we make entrepreneurship a craft with a body of knowledge that's respected and there's data behind it to prove that what we're teaching works? Terrific, thank you. Um, just a quick reminder to our audience today, we are taking your questions this hour, so use the box below the live stream to ask your questions of our guest. One question that I wanted to start with while we wait for uh, the audience questions to come in is um, an age-old one. And I think you've already answered it in your overview, but I'll just give you one last shot at it. Can entrepreneurship be taught? And how has your answer to that question changed, if at all, since you entered teaching? Yeah, <laughs> that is the fundamental question. I mean, when I first was an entrepreneur and I did not, um, <coughs> I didn't think about it very much. I thought, well, you know, it's just, you're born to be an entrepreneur. It's just kind of you learn how to do it. You know, you, it's common sense. And many people have said that over the years. And then um, when they asked me to teach, um, I, I realized that there's a much higher standard here at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and, I, and I had this discussion with Ed Roberts, and he said, well, first of all, it is teachable. I have the data here that shows that the more times you're an entrepreneur, the higher your odds of success are, and the shorter the time is that you're, you're successful. So it is teachable, but, you know, and, and it, if you don't believe that, then you shouldn't be teaching. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the first part of that was really the compelling thing. Of course it can be taught. You know, I've, I've been an entrepreneur three times, and the first time I really didn't know what I was doing, but by the third time. Now that raises the question, can it be taught? What do we mean by teaching? Mm. And that's why this, this, this clarification of it being a craft is important, because it's not taught in a deterministic way. It's not taught in just in a classroom. It's a combination of theory and practice, just like a craft is. Someone tells you, here's some first principles, but then you have to do an apprenticeship to really understand it and work with, with some other people and apply it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really, that's what we do. And is, can I just show some slides as far as what we're doing in that, that area? Sure. Let me just do this quickly because, um, you know, we, first of all, I, I'm going to go through this and all the slides will be available. We break up entrepreneurship into two types. A lot of people don't, you know, the first rule of engineering you learn at MIT or any engineering school is define your terms. So what do we mean by entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. And there's two different types. There's SME entrepreneurship, which means I'm starting a restaurant or an IT service company or something that's really for local demand. On the other hand, there, you can start an innovation-driven uh, company or venture, and that's for global markets that, that, that really has some underlying it. And these are different systems here, and there's a paper on that that we'll go through. So we're focused specifically on what we call IDE entrepreneurship. And IDE entrepreneurship still leaves the question, is what's innovation? And innovation is not just an invention in a lab. Innovation is something that is an invention that is then commercialized to create. I invention is an invention, an idea, a patent, uh, a technology that then has to be commercialized to create some value. And so I find this equation very helpful when we define innovation related to innovation-driven entrepreneurship. And when we think about innovation and entrepreneurship, I think it's important to understand that they're different in that entrepreneurship really is about that commercial, commercialization aspect of that equation. And it's about the business essentials, because innovation is done everywhere on campus. The Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship is about entrepreneurship. And so understanding those business essentials, how do you create an, an, a new venture? And anytime you put engineering after a term here at MIT, it gives it an increased uh, seriousness, so we call it venture engineering. <laughs> and, uh, but we, how do you frame the decisions to start a company? How do you start it? How do you grow it? That's what we focus on. And other people do the technology essentials, but having those two work very closely together is how you make great companies. Because in one of my companies, we had a 3D haptic force feedback device. And so Thomas Massey was saying, well, what do you want me to, what do I need to do? I said, what can you do? And he said, I can, I can, I can build it like this size. Then we say, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, let's see what the customers want. Oh, here's what they want to do it for medical simulation. Can you do that? Yes, I can do that. Here's how I do it. Okay, good, he can do it. But what price point? And so it's this going back and forth mm -hmm. that makes MIT so great at this. And just to finish it, is there, what we've seen is that there's a huge demand for entrepreneurship uh, education now at MIT and around the world. Literally millions and millions of people want to be entrepreneurs, whereas when I graduated from college in 1980, we didn't even think of that as a career. We didn't even know what the word was, to be quite honest. I, I went to the arts and crafts school down the street, mm. and so we didn't know what <laughs> entrepreneurship was. Uh, but, but today, this demand is taking off everywhere, and the supply of quality entrepreneurship education is not kept up with it at all. And so what we've had is this plethora of storytelling out there to, that's, that people say that's education, and it isn't. Telling stories is not, does not meet the MIT standards of education. So what we had to do was we had to figure out how do we teach education, and we realized that it, it has a lot to do with spirit first. You have to be able to um, have that hacking mentality. You have to have the, the spirit of a pirate. Be willing to, as you see here, it, you, if all the fish are swimming this way in their suits, are you willing to swim the other way? Are you willing to hack the system, rewire it? And you know, the rest of the world calls that creative irreverence. We at MIT call that hacking. But <laughs> that hacking mentality is fundamental to entrepreneurship. And then the next thing is if they just, I'm sorry, if they just had the spirit, 
and not the skills, we'd be sending them out into battle to fail. We need to give them the equipment, we need to give them the skill sets. So it's both spirit and skills. And so focusing on the skills, that's what we do now. And we, we break it down to different students, segments that are here, and everybody focus on the ready-to-go entrepreneur. We also train people who are corporate entrepreneurs, people we call entrepreneurship amplifiers, as well as people who are just curious about entrepreneurship. And we've developed a whole kind of a, a, a framework to do that where it starts with how do you come up with ideas, how do you come up with a nucleation stage, how do you come up with ideas, initial team, how do you define your product, how do you do the primary market research, how do you get that product market fit right, and then how do you build the entire venture. And we've kind of laid that out here, and this is a systematic way to teach it. And we do it by building a toolbox, not just infatuated with whatever the latest new book is in entrepreneurship. <laughs> because there's this fad mentality when you don't take an, a, a, an area seriously that whatever the shiny new toy is, that's the answer. And, and we can't have that. At MIT, we need to build the toolbox, we need to think of the tools, and they need to be curated by academics. And so lastly, we have a methodology to get market product fit called disciplined entrepreneurship. And that's really um, what differentiates us from having this rigor, but we also differentiate ourselves in that we teach people how to fish here at MIT we are not interested in the fact whether they catch a fish or not, that academic institutions. Although they do catch fish, Freddie Karras, one of our students, just went public on, on uh, NASDAQ uh, with Brad Peterson, another MIT alumni, and uh, his company is valued at $2 billion now. So they do catch fish if we teach them how to fish. And lastly, there's a lot of information that's available that you can go through and get very cheaply on Amazon, the Discipline Entrepreneurship book, the workbook that just came out, online, free online tools, and on edX, there's a whole series of mm -hmm. courses that you can take for free, and I would encourage anyone who's curious to do that. So thank you for letting me go through that. And then just, I wanna say lastly, is that people misunderstand a lot about entrepreneurship. And one thing is that the idea is the most important thing. It's about execution. Um, you gotta have the ideas, you know, but it's about having the spirit to take those ideas and bring them to market of a spirit of a pirate, and then you have to have the execution skills of a Navy SEAL, and that's what makes for great companies. <laughs> well, thank you very much for all of that, Bill. <laughs> that was great. I think we ought to go to our audience questions yes. now. Please. So the first one is from a former student of yours, Avid in Santa Monica. Oh. Says, I loved taking your new enterprise course. Yes. I have applied your teachings in my companies and venture funds. What technology areas do you see rapid growth in the next five years that you're excited about? Yeah, so first of all, the, you know, the, the one that everyone's talking about, well, there's, the, there's a few that everyone's talking about, and one that, one that I will say I'm not that interested in, and two that are very interesting is, the first one is the uberfication of the world. This idea of having platforms between disaggregated markets, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, disaggregated markets and supply, and even dis un underutilized assets, the uberfication of the world or the Airbnb of the world, these platforms are going to continue to be there and they're gonna continue to drive um, lots of opportunity and efficiencies in our economy. The second thing is, is um, data. Data is exploding and machine learning and utilization of that data is really where the action is. It used to be when I first started that hardware was the big thing. That was where you got competitive advantage uh, when I was at IBM. And then it was software, you know, the kind of the era of Microsoft. Now it's moved to data is the gold. Now you need hardware and you need software. These things aren't uh, mutually exclusive, but now data is. And when you look at LinkedIn um, getting bought, they weren't bought for their technology. They were not bought for their revenue stream. They were bought for the data. And so being able to collect data and, and take that data and make it information that's actionable is a huge opportunity in the marketplace. The other one that everybody's in is drones. And I think there's a drone mania on now, and, and uh, it's, it's great, but I think there's too much infatuation with the technology there and not with enough with the, the business opportunity. The utility. Yes, yes. So Alex in New York asks, why don't we see as many successful MIT-founded companies as we see Harvard, Wharton, and Stanford ones? <laughs> uh, uh, what was his name? Alex. Alex. Uh, Alex, uh, uh, pound for pound, MIT punches far above its weight when it comes to uh, startup companies. Uh, we are not a huge uh, school, but 
you should be extremely proud of what we do. The other schools are bigger, um, but when you look at Ed Roberts' study, we produce entrepreneurs like crazy. Um, and, those co and those entrepreneurs do extremely well. So I wish everybody did that. I'm not hating on anybody else. I went to Harvard, I love Stanford, I, I love all these, but they envy what we do in developing entrepreneurs. They might be better at venture capitalists, they might be better at some other things, but from starting an innovation-driven entrepreneurial venture, nobody's better than MIT. To give you one data point on the size differential, uh, those two schools both have two to three times as many alumni as MIT does. So yeah. that, that sort of gives you a scale. And when you look at the studies, <laughs> it's often you know a Microsoft or a Facebook, and it skews everything. Whereas right. at MIT, it's absolutely pervasive. And, right. and look, you know, that doesn't mean we're better. Um, but in entrepreneurship, we have in our DNA. We are the school that is. Um, we, we weren't on the Oxford Cambridge model. You know, that is to, to create clergy to train clergy, <laughs> knowledge for knowledge sake. MIT is mens a manas. It is, it is a school of immigrants and immigrants' kids. It is a pure meritocracy as best you can. That is entrepreneurship. So interesting you mention Oxford and Cambridge because the next question is from Carlos in Cambridge, UK. <laughs> uh, given that was that a setup, Carlos? <laughs> I, I don't know. It was there before you mentioned it. Given that entrepreneurship is teachable, what other environmental contextual factors are required for aspiring entrepreneurs to succeed, especially in developing economies? Yeah, great question. So what we've, what we've, we, we look at how do we assess our success and how do we align our programs. And we've come to the realization that there's four key factors in this. Um, and we call it the 4-H club of, of Cambridge. And the first one is the heart. You have to be able to, 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 to have the mindset of an entrepreneur, what I was talking about, to be the spirit of a pirate, to be willing to be different. If all those fish are swimming this way, not only are you willing to swim that way, but does it excite you? Are endorphins released in your body? And that is what people get when they come to MIT. This is the hacking mentality. So you have to have the right mindset. That's the first H, heart. The second H is the head. Once I know that I want to try to do it, now what's the knowledge? What, give me a framework as to how I do that. So that's the knowledge, the head. The third H is the hands. That is, do I, I know what to do, but can I actually do it? And this is the mentorship aspect. It's theory and practice, theory and practice, going back and forth. And so this is where we use the action learning here, and we encourage everyone to use action learning. The last H is much less obvious, and it was much less obvious to me, and it really became after I was here for five years, and that is home. The, the, the aspect of having a community of entrepreneurs to support each other, because you never have enough resources as an entrepreneur. It's an up and down cycle emotionally, and you need, you need a community to help you. You need to be able at three o'clock in the morning to say, hey, Judy, you know, I just don't know what to do at this point. Say, I've been there, just relax, take it easy. It's not just the emotional sport. Let's call this other person. And so building Actually, that three community. Actually, three in the morning, I'd say go to sleep. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but there is that, someone in the community will be there to help you. And so thinking of all of those four H's as you develop it is critically important. Um, as you think about developing the entrepreneurs. We've also done a whole bunch of work with regard to entrepreneurial ecosystems, and I know that's a huge word right, you know, buzz area right now. Um, and, and we can get into some of that theory, but the single necessary and sufficient condition for an entrepreneurial ecosystem is an entrepreneur. And to create entrepreneurs, you gotta develop the heart first, then you gotta give them knowledge as to what to do, the head, then you got to give them an opportunity to learn it, the internships as we we're talking about with the craft, and then you have to be able to have a community, a home, to be able to do it. Right, I wish I, like I could that. see you, Carlos, to see if I, that's answering your question, but we have an asynchronous technology here. Well, I think that the one piece that it doesn't answer in his question might be, uh, how does one, you know, how does one find that, or what are the characteristics of developing economies that might 
be the substrate for entrepreneurism yeah, yeah. that you're talking about. I mean, that, that's sort of what we do in this community, but he was specifically interested in developing economies. So we have a center called the Legatum Center mm -hmm. at MIT, and Georgina Campbell runs that, who was an Oxford person. Um, and she's focused on that issue. And, 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 I, and, and, and I will give you my perspective is that Entrepreneurship is not the same everywhere. You know, to, everybody says, I want to recreate Silicon Valley. No, there's one Silicon Valley, and there was a certain context in which that made sense. Boston is not the same. New York is not the same. You know, D.C. is not the same. Austin is not the same. But that doesn't mean you can't have vibrant, uh, vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystems. But all, all those I just gave are in the United States. And there is a certain kind of social, kind of political context to that. A rule of laws and the like that's different if you go to other parts of the world. Now, if I go to to um, to China, it, the government is very very influential. It, it's more of a tops down type of entrepreneurship. If I go to the Middle East, it's much more of a bottoms up. Whereas in the United States, it's it's some government involvement. It's a lot of bottoms up, but in those places, it varies dramatically. And then even we're talking about China. Now you go to Korea or Japan, the corporates are very very strong. So. It, there are different flavors, and you have to customize entrepreneurship to those areas. But let me say, we learn a lot whenever we work with places about what they're doing in entrepreneurship. And this is critical if we want entrepreneurship to be a serious field, taking a serious body of knowledge, a profession. Everybody needs to contribute to that. This mm -hmm. is much bigger than MIT. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on from that question. Uh, Richard in Marblehead, Mass. asks, can you talk about China? What about MIT Sloan's work in Kunming? What mm -hmm. is our program for them, and what have you learned to date about entrepreneurship there? Actually follows up very nicely on the previous question. So I don't know what's Kunming. I, I've been to <coughs> Tsinghua. Where's Kang, Kunming? Do you, do you know? I do not know what the MIT Sloan work in Kunming is. I, okay. That, that is a new one on me. So, um, well, let me just say, I, I am not an expert in China. I have, I have been there, and... Uh, the book has been translated into n numerous uh, versions of Chinese, but it, it's it's we are working with China um, as as best we can. But a lot of it is working through people like Xinhua and Fudan University because we don't understand the context and we can't you know split our resources. One of the rules of entrepreneurship is. Focus, focus, focus. Do what you do and do it well, and then count on other people to do that. So we really work through places like Fudan. We have an innovation node in Hong Kong that we work with. Char Professor Charlie Sedini is over there. But we have to be careful that we, we just say, here are our first principles. How do they work in your environment? And then they'll give us feedback for that. One of the things we see in China is that their scale is just enormous. Everything has to scale very, very quickly. Um, and that's, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of money available in China right now for entrepreneurship. There's a huge demand for it. They're focused on agriculture uh, as, as a big area. So we have a sense of it, but again, it has to be, it has to be customized to, to, to their environment. Mm -hmm. So following on a little bit on that, Jerry in Pennsylvania asks, how do you think about the entrepreneurship opportunities in traditional industries, such as food service, consumer packed goods, et cetera? And I was going to say agriculture, because yeah. that's certainly true domestically as well as internationally. Yeah, we just had a great talk at our center, which I, I wish had been, uh, uh, had been put out onto, uh, on, on video. And it was by uh, a professor at MIT, Bank Holmstrom. Mm -hmm. And Ben Holmstrom is, is, is a very smart person. And that was recently <laughs> acknowledged by the fact that he won a Nobel Prize. Right, right. And we've had a lot of discussions about entrepreneurship. And one day he popped into my office and said, Bill, innovation is overrated. And I said, Ben, you've, just, you've got me. Sit down, explain. <laughs> and what he said to me was very, very interesting. And this was the basis of his talk that he gave uh, last week. He said, um, he said, we overemphasize disruptive innovation, whereas over 90% of the value that's created is through imitation. And by imitation, what, what bank means is not copying. It says taking something that, that works over here or is, or is going on over here and bringing it into an environment and then refining it. And if you think about that for a second, 
we all talk about disruptive innovation more than we should. I mean, there's a value of disruptive innovation, but not as much as the literature is talking about it right now. And it's exciting. It's a shiny thing over here. But what's happening going on over here in, in a lot of these industrial things is incremental innovation, lateral innovation. And not only, it's not just in these areas. We, it's, when you look at it, you say, wait a second, Facebook, Facebook, there was Friendster and there was MySpace before them. They took the idea that already existed and then they just copy, uh, they imitated it and they made it better. And a lot of times this lateral innovation, same thing with Google. Google was not the first one. They just took it and modified it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these traditional industries, this word disruptive doesn't help. It's, it's overemphasized. We need to think about incremental innovation, lateral innovation that will come in. And this is what Banks talking about when he says imitation. I think sometimes people get paralyzed by the fact that they have to have a new idea, something they, that's completely different as opposed to taking an existing idea and making it better. And that's yes. kind of the iceberg un, under the water of the economy that could use a lot of that kind exactly. of Exactly. And that's what when he's talking about yeah. the traditional industries. That, that's where more of the value is. It might not be as sexy as coming up with the new Snapchat. But most of the value, over 90%, according to Bank, is from exactly what you said, taking something and then making it work better. Yeah. Amber in Phoenix asks, you may have already said this, but what does the Trust Center offer for alumni entrepreneurs? Oh. Mm, there's the question. <laughs> Amber, I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, this is not the answer <coughs> you're going to want to hear, um, unless, unless you have some, a, a, a son or a daughter who's a student at MIT. We are overwhelmed by the, the student demand. We have eight, um, eight people uh, in our staff at, at the Trust Center, and this, we have thousands of students here who want uh, our attention. And so we've had to make that decision from a focus standpoint that we support the alumni through things like edX and the publishing of these books, which I think you'll find very helpful. But for the concierge service, um, that has to go through the, the, you know, the Alumni Association or the Enterprise Forum or, or, or some other venue. Or vent, um, Venture Mentoring venture Service mentoring also service. does that. And, yes. they, and they have a recently started, well, I think they have some satellite offices, one in Northern California, Northern California. and yeah. there's a few other places because I know that, that Don Schobers travels around. But that's really the one that I think comes the closest to the concierge yeah. type service that you talk about. That's a really good point. And Rolf, Rolf does a great job in Northern California. Yeah. And what, what, I, what we do for them is if, if we can leverage it, what I'll do is we, they run a course just like we run at MIT using right. the material. And then I will get on and, and give a lecture um, without having to get on a plane to go out there. But if I'm out there, we can do something. But right. It, that has been the venue. You're right, VMS and the uh, Alumni Network and mm -hmm. um, the Enterprise Forum. Right. So, I'm, I, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. I think it's Niels um, in Copenhagen. This is a very international <laughs> one today. What are you are making this up or is this no, just all? <laughs> this is real. What are the top two or three deadly mistakes that you see startups make within their first year or two? Oh, well, the first thing is they think that the idea this goes back to this one. The most overrated thing in entrepreneurship is the original idea. People say, well, I have the idea. The idea is such a small part of it. It's, it's, it's like, if it's 5%, I'd be shocked in most cases. Now, people say, well, in a biotech, it is. That's, you know, that's, but there's still, even in that case, you've got so much to execute. We just had a round table with some of our students. And I, and I, for our venture engineering class for undergraduates, and said, you know, how much did you think of it was done when you finished the class. And they said, well, we thought it was like 60% there to being a company. Now, in hindsight, how much was done? Oh, 1% at best. <laughs> and then, so, then, cause then what, after the 100K, how much you think was done? Oh, we thought 70% was done. In reality, how much was really done? You know, 2%. And what happens is, is the original idea and the original plan is just the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then what you have to do is you have to acquire a team now this is, this is, and that's the biggest piece of this pie is, what people don't realize is they focus, especially MIT people, they focus on the things that they, they can quantify that are deterministic. Let me get this technology to work. Whereas this, this, this carbon-based life form called humans is, is the most essential part. And how do you recruit a team? How do you motivate that team? How do you keep that team aligned and fighting through the hard battles that will happen? Mm -hmm. um, th th that's the number one thing is, is, is 
it's all about the people. The second problem is, is that people, and I was just going through this this morning with two teams, is they want to take their technology and they want you as the customer to understand how great their technology is. And that's just the wrong approach. It's design thinking. It's, it's we say, you do have a great technology. Now I want you to invert the process and I want you to tell me who is the customer and build your company from the customer back to incorporate this great technology in providing value to them. Yeah. And so it's just that mindset. But as engineers, we tend to want to tell people about what we built and uh, that's, that's our challenge. So D in Boston asks, can you talk about how MIT is spearheading innovation in established S&P 500 firms? How do we drive innovation in large firms that are stuck in old models and culture? Yeah, so if I go back to this one, um, yeah, this is, this is one of the big things. And I was, I was hoping to write a book on this this, this this summer, but I did not have enough time. Um, I worked at IBM for 11 years. And so I saw how big companies work from 1981 to 1993. That mean five minutes? Yep. Oh, and uh, big companies have a lot of benefits. What, what, let me tell you what they have. They have cash, they have customers, and they have mature products. All of those are things that entrepreneurs are trying to get. However, with those things comes a lot of inertia, and it forces them to, to be very conservative about what they do. So they don't have the passion, they don't have the ability to fail that, that startups do. And so what we're, and, and by the way, I could spend all day, every day talking to corporations, but that's not, you know, when I look at these or our students, uh, only about 15 to 20% right now want to be corporate entrepreneurs, but that is one of our focus areas. So the skill sets that we talk about in, in the online courses and the books and everything, those are relevant to big companies. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing more and more that they want to do that. We have online dialogue with General Electric, with, mm -hmm. with, um, with Parker Hannifin has had success in this area, uh, Michelin. So it, it, at the end of the day, a lot of companies look at it and say, what you do is just very efficient product development, uh, product you know, conceptualization, management, and development. And they're right. So that would, that would be it. And, but we hope to do more in that area. All right. So I'm going to skip the second. I'm sorry. I apologize, Juan, um, in Guatemala. So there's yet another country heard from. But uh, the last question, because we are running out of time, is going to be Lexi's in Cambridge. Zuckerberg is delivering the commencement address at Harvard this spring versus Tim Cook at MIT. Which would you rather attend? I'd rather hear Salman Khan. <laughs> uh, He's already spoken here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a winner's bias in these things. And, and to, to hear that Mark, and I have nothing against Mark Zuckerberg, but Mark Zuckerberg is a, is, is a, is a wild statistical outlier in entrepreneurship. Mm. That's like saying to get rich, I saw someone buy a lottery ticket. You know, <laughs> he defies what it is. First of all, most entrepreneurs are not young. It's not their first thing. The idea doesn't just take off like that. It's a grind that you have to go through. So, you know, in the season of basketball, that's like saying all basketball players are like LeBron James, be like LeBron James. There's one LeBron James in the world. So I'm not saying that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have interesting things to say. Um, I, I, I like to hear from the people who actually kind of started it in a more methodical way. It, it wasn't just, they, they, ca they caught lightning in a bottle. And if you look at a lot of ours, I would like, Freddie Kerr is just a company. He, he's, he's in his 30s, he's gone through the process, it's his third one. That's much more representative. That's mm -hmm. a better role model for our students than Mark Zuckerberg, with all due respect. Okay. Well, on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Wait, wait Judy, can I ask you a question? Can you tell everyone what you're going to do in your retirement? I find this <laughs> fascinating. After how many uh, years here? Eight, eight years, years here. here. What do you tell the tell the audience uh, what you're going to do? Well, I uh, it's it's not a firm plan yet. I actually <laughs> got some very good advice from a very wise MIT alumnus and good friend, Harbo Jensen, who said, Judy. Don't plan everything. Just take some time off and allow for opportunities to come forward that you might not have ever thought of otherwise, because that will happen. So initially what I'm going to do, because I wanted to own some real estate, I'm in the process of buying a small farm in western Massachusetts because I can't afford real estate in Cambridge. <laughs> Nobody can. Yeah. <laughs> 
<clears throat> and um, and I will take the summer off to move and uh, look around and see what's going to happen. But one of the things I do want to have, regardless of whether I work again or not, is have some animals. Great. I want to have chickens and goats and horses and dogs and cats and because I think that would be uh, a lot of fun. When I sat back and thought about what were the moments of my life that had been the happiest, it was invariably something that was close to nature and nurturing animals. That's terrific. So, well, I whatever have been a veterinarian, I think. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you do, do it with the spirit of a pirate and the execution skills of a Navy SEAL and be entrepreneurial. <laughs> well, I will try. I think the Navy SEAL part might be the hardest. <laughs> I'm not that disciplined. <laughs> anyway, on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, thank you, Bill, for joining us. And thanks to the MIT alumni for uh, tuning in today and for your good questions. If we didn't get to your question, we'll pass it along to Bill after the webcast, and you'll be able to find the archive of this conversation along with the past faculty forum talks on the MIT Alumni Association website. Please join us next month for another session of the Faculty Forum Online. Judy, can I encourage people to uh, tweet me? That's the easiest way. Okay. If they tweet me with a question, I'll respond relatively quickly. All right. Thank you.